Welcome to Barley and Me. I'm your host, Ben Rice. This is episode 105. We're here today in San Francisco, California at Black Hammer Brewing's Beer Garden, which is called Vilkomen. We're here today with the owner, Jim Furman. How's it going, everyone? Hey, Jim. Thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So, I got to ask you the question I ask everybody. How's business here at Black Hammer Brewing? It's been going great since we opened Vilkomen. Uh, we're having a lot of fun here. We've been super well received in the neighborhood and uh we're actually at the point where we can barely keep up with consumption <laughs> so it's the problem we all want to have as brewers yeah so what kind of system do you have like what size system do you have to we've got keep a, up with that production we have a wee little system it's a uh, seven barrel um seven barrel system with a lot of tanks we've got uh, 12 seven barrel fermenters and then two 15 barrel fermenters and then 10 conditioning tanks oh man so yeah we've got got a lot of tanks yeah because i've been to the brewery it's a pretty small operation kind of tucked in the corner there so you're just trying to maximize that space or oh absolutely the tetris music plays <laughs> every day <laughs> can you get a bigger one in there or is it like too short for i such a thing i think we could <laughs> i think we really should just be looking for a bigger space um yeah is that kind so, of the thought but, process behind uh will come in? uh yeah that's that's on the horizon that's all part of our long-term plan Sorry, I'm going to keep stepping on all your answers. I don't mind. <laughs> so how long has Black Hammer been open? Uh, we opened in uh, summer of 2015, and then we opened Vilcommon uh, middle of May of this year. Yeah. So we're not, we're just, we're almost at the two-month point no, for really? the space. Yeah. Is it really? Oh, it's July. Is it May really that close to, I don't know, I've had no idea what month it is for like four months. <laughs> I've, I'm like, yeah, May, that was like five months ago, six months ago. Gotcha. I have no idea. <laughs> What time of the year it is. Okay. <laughs> so have you guys had any, uh, what's what's it been like kind of being a brewery in San Francisco, which is, uh, I imagine, real estate's tough, foot traffic, there's a lot of it, but are they coming in? or People are definitely coming in. So, so we opened in the summer of 2015, and uh, we had this really great idea to open a craft brewery in San Francisco. Apparently so did everyone else. <laughs> so uh, I think it was something like, nine or ten breweries opened in 2015 and then i think almost as many in 2016 yeah it's so it, it went from being uh to use a cliche right for the picking <laughs> to i wouldn't say fiercely competitive breweries aren't really typically fierce right yeah you know, we're, we're collaborative and friendly but you know there's a limited number of livers yeah. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and top handles in the city um so what used to be a bar owner would say, oh, I just want to you know, serve local beers and say, and they say local, they would mean the Bay Area, which right. is, you know, what, 7 million people, 9 million people now, something like that. Um, and there would be a handful of breweries to pick from. Now you could, you could rotate out a, a different brewery on 20 different tap handles and not have the same brewery twice yeah. for months. Months. So it's, yeah. If you're a bar that doesn't focus on local, you're an insane person. Like, how can you even run a bar in the state age in California without a focus on Oh, local? people still love their Bud Light. They really, it's a thing. Well, you can still have it on, but to have, like, <laughs> nothing, like, to have, like, two local taps, like, what are you doing? Agreed. I mean, it's not everyone's primary goal. So it's, and so, and also the, so competing with, there's the, the craft beer competition, which of course is always healthy and pushes okay. us to do better um, and improve our processes and streamline hopefully not put too much money into marketing because yeah. it doesn't really make a better product. But uh, then there's also competing with larger breweries because they, what they offer is, you know, ease of ease of product, right? Yeah. Like it's like Bud Light is basically the Walmart of beers yeah. and it's super easy and, and relatively cheap. Yeah. And they economies of scale, you know, for all that. So it's, it's an interesting world out there right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I love it personally. I don't know how you feel about it now that you're knee deep in it. But, uh, <laughs> oh, it's tons of fun. I love this stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. incredible. I, you know what I liked uh, walking in here? Seeing all the old school beers on. That's great. Is that like what your guys' focus kind of is? Is doing those old classic European styles? Oh, that, I wasn't sure what you meant by old school. Got it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we initially, our dream, or my dream, the, the dream to open Black Hammer was to be a lager brewery. And that's the name comes from my, my Burning Man nickname of Hammer <laughs> and Black Rock City, Black Hammer Brewing. 
<laughs> uh, we're not entrenched in Burning Man. I haven't been in a few years, but we bring a lot of that creativity um, and ease of access and really just the, finding all the joy in life that we possibly can in creating our own. But so we wanted to be a lager brewery primarily when we opened, and that was our goal. Um, was classic styles because the Germans are absolutely onto something with beer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they might know a thing or two. And uh, but when we opened, we very quickly realized, oh yeah, we're in San Francisco. We need to make IPAs. Yeah, it's <laughs> the predominant style here. Yeah. Kind of what San Francisco is known for at this point. <laughs> so uh, we've actually had a lot of fun, and we still are with IPAs. We're doing a bunch of new things that I can't yet talk about this year All right. but it involves a lot of lab equipment okay um, but uh, the continental styles especially the German lagers are I see is really the evolution of beer right like uh, in terms of they are the beers that you can drink every day yeah. and not lose your your palate or your BAC too much yeah <laughs> exactly so I'm drinking right now a, a Bach Party Bach. That's, first of all, a great name. Thank you. Pretty simple, straightforward. Probably came pretty easy, but it's a great name. And nobody's making a Bach. Like, I was like, yeah, I want that Bach. That's oh, fantastic. A question. Getting that Bach, getting that Sparkle Pony. Another great name. How is the Bach? It's pretty solid. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how that batch came out. Yeah. I think we brewed it six months ago. Yeah. It takes a, you, have, you have to lager yeah. a Bach for yeah. quite some time to get... Everything to, to smooth out and really let the malt shine. Yeah, it's it's pretty stellar. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, and the reason we brew that is because it's just not brewed. I mean, and also we love lagers. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I was looking for, like a few years ago, looking for a traditional Bach, and I literally couldn't buy one. Yeah. It's just not a thing. Doesn't exist. Nope. And I would go to, I think, like City Beer Store, and they would have, uh, or... Can't think of it. Healthy spirits. There you yeah. go. <laughs> and they only have smoked box. But, oh. um, and so if, if everyone doesn't know what a traditional box is, um, traditional box really came before the German lagers that we're used to. Uh, they were the, the go-to German lagers. Um, basically like a like an Oktoberfest or a Martzen is a light box. Yes. So. Then you got your my box. Uh, and then there's my box. Yeah. When you have some extra hops laying around. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I this is this is a wonderful thing. I also really like the uh, layout of, of Wukaman as well. I was expecting uh, like a beer garden, like outdoor stuff, but like this is very cool. You bring the outdoors in. It's like German style uh, seating, great spot. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, yeah it's uh, <laughs> almost two years ago. I went on a trip to Munich, and besides going to Oktoberfest, which is amazing, spent a lot of time just walking aimlessly around Munich through parks and stumbling across uh, beer gardens in the middle of parks with hundreds of Germans and non-Germans enjoying steins of beer under trees <laughs> in parks. And I just thought, we have to bring this back. Yeah. I just want to, uh, since you brought it up earlier, I just want to know, what is it that appeals to you about Burning Man? Like what For people that maybe haven't been or don't understand the appeal, what is the appeal? And also, how do you get the name Hammer? That's <laughs> because I'm a tool. But, uh, <laughs> it really had more to do with my direct Northeast management style <laughs> while running a theme camp. But uh, I don't want to flout my ego too much. Um, is flout the right word? That works. <laughs> Fluff. <laughs> Flaunt. Um, but so what Burning Man did for me is before I was doing this, I was a nuclear engineer um, working on nuclear testing, okay. designing and teaching people how to design nuclear test facilities for uh, testing post-accident nuclear safety equipment. Oh, my goodness. Um, and this is equipment that would be – some of my equipment was at Fukushima. It didn't fail, <laughs> but it wasn't able to succeed because of the, of the tsunami, which knocked out power. Right. But uh, anyway, I was working on that for – 10 years of doing a lot of travel to China and travel to D.C. to work, meet with the NRC and the government and give presentations of what I'm doing, answer questions. Um, and um, I can sit closer to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> and while doing all that, I didn't have a creative or passionate outlet for all this energy. 
right? Yeah. Um, and not only that, right? Like I really just needed to build things and needed to really care a lot about what I was building um, and have the like ability to be creative and uh, inspired and take that inspiration places I want it to go, you know, not just do the calc, turn the money crank, which is <laughs> what nuclear consulting can Yeah, be. I would imagine that's a pretty lucrative because it's a pretty limited supply of people who can do what you did. Oh, it was, yeah, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, bes- so besides that, it's a huge outlet for building things, uh, being creative with art, building a camp, throwing parties, all this kind of stuff. It's also, there's a, we evolved in tribes, right? And the tribe is a support group that it's not just a support group. You support them, they support you, um, and you share ideas, you work towards common goals, you protect each other, you party together, you celebrate together, um, and you have that attachment with people that you're maybe related to, maybe not, like my sister and brother-in-law are in my Burning Man theme camp called Darwin Fish Tank. <laughs> plug right there. Nice. We're not going to be on the playa this year, but we'll see about next year. We're taking a year off after, after 10 years. But... Uh, Burning Man gives us that. It gives us that group to work together on. And I mean, we would work together on this building, this camp that we bring to the desert all summer. I mean, we start working in April and we're already realized we're fucked. (laughs) We don't have enough time. And Burning Man's like the first, it's the week before Labor Day. Yeah. So, but then after building the brewery, I now have a tribe, which is my brewery staff. Yeah. Right. Bigger, Uh, stronger. Exactly. And I don't have to, tear it down after a week <laughs> <laughs> so i i don't feel the pull as much as i used to i might oh. not go again oh it's i oh. it's it's a lot of work to go yeah you have to really care a lot of investment yep and it's a lot of investment time to, emotional physical all of it absolutely to prepare while you're there that that work I, i'm down to do it's just the months of preparation no and then the like two weeks of recovery basically from throwing yourself at a most inhospitable environment on the <laughs> West Coast. But, uh, yeah, no, no regrets, but I might not go again. Oh, no. Yeah, the first, uh, the first. Uh, I don't know if you, is it offensive to say burner? Is that the, is that a terrible, terrible? Not at all. Word? Okay. So the, <laughs> as long as you don't think a burner is someone who smokes a lot of weed, because that's right. not what it means. Right. I'm talking about people that go to Burning <laughs> Man a lot. My, the first burner I ever met uh, was an elementary school teacher from San Francisco, and she was involved in, like, competitive float building. Okay. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We built a float this year. We won. We got best float. It cost us $520,000 to make. I'm like, what? You're wow. An, how would... did you come up with that money? <laughs> also, was it worth to put half a million dollars for, like, a float for, like, one competition? <laughs> That's amazing. That's insane to me. I was like, hey, I mean, you won. Like, end of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, our uh, our Burning Man art car. I think the car itself cost nine thousand dollars. I think we spent a total of twenty. It's called <laughs> the Janky Whale. I mean, it has fifth, like twelve foot flippers that flip using carabiners and parachute cord and, and people. <laughs> and this is self designed, I assume. Oh yeah, yeah. Sort. I think it sort of designed itself as we built it. It evolved into yeah. the whale that it was. <laughs> yeah. So I've never been, obviously, and. Not uh, not exciting person. Uh, <laughs> don't like fun. It's a thing about it's me. It's not the be all end all of excitement, right? But I always imagined it as kind of like a Mad Max Fury Road type of world, a little bit. Oh, definitely. <laughs> so that's the that's the a little bit. I'd say a little bit more of the older Burning Man. Say like late up to like late two thousand watts. I, I wouldn't say it's gotten more fluffy, but it's gotten more fluffy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's bound to happen as word gets out. The internet really just ruins everything that's, like, small. <laughs> yeah. But not ruins. Changes? You can say ruins. Creates I mean, it's not a, it's not quite ruined, but it's... Creates the, adaptations you didn't expect. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Okay. That aren't always in a direction you'd prefer. Suboptimal. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite word. <laughs> Now, have you had to use that in this business a lot, suboptimal, in the beer industry? Or, like, this beer is suboptimal, we must dump it. So uh, that is unfortunate. We've definitely done that. Yeah. It's happened. It's uh, yeah. sad but true. And it's it was due to, I don't know, one of them was an underpitch of yeast in our earlier years where this happens with home brewing, but on a much smaller scale. If you underpitch yeast, it might never finish fermenting. And if you don't catch it, you end up with 
autoly- autolysis, which is yeast uh, committing suicide because it's unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it hasn't gotten the right treatment or medication. And uh, yeah. so it's, it's been a, a less than one handful of batches that we've nice. had to dump, but we're, we're not going to serve bad beer. Yeah, you can't. So. And this, because like one bad batch is your entire reputation at this point. It's so competitive out yeah. there. Yeah. So people like they'll, t- they'll people will go online and tell you people that you're terrible. Oh, people do that anyway. Oh, they do it anyway, right? They do. I mean, uh. we've we've got a. I mean, our nectar of life. That's our Kolsch. It has won. It won third in the state last year. It won second at the San Diego International Beer Competition this year in the Kolsch category. I didn't get one on oh, Untapped. No. It's three point five six, and I would just and I, if you look at it, people give it two stars. It's an objectively good Kolsch. <laughs> <laughs> so what are their general complaints that they're seeing? Are you thinking people don't understand the Kolsch style? Or they don't drink Kolsch's? Or what do you think the Oh, it's is? not dry hopped heavily enough. Yeah. What? <laughs> you, but you got a little bit of sulfur in there, right? Like a little... I'm not getting any sulfur. No. <laughs> oh. Nice. I mean, typically with a Kolsch, you're not going to get much sulfur because it's... Typically, either hybrid yeast or, an, or a lager yeast at a little bit warmer temperatures, so they don't tend to put off as much sulfur, but yeah. your mileage may vary. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, people just, uh, they love to not like, uh, not IPAs. I don't know oh, what the world is. Like, it's like not very hoppy. I'm like, it's not supposed <laughs> to be yeah. hoppy. They're not all, we, not all hoppy. We're just going to keep making great beer. I mean, it's. Uh, Problem solved. It's. Basically, whenever I start feeling too cheerful, I'll look at Untapped, <laughs> and I cannot be the first brewer on, the, on your podcast to have said that because it's there's an event that I need to be I need to make sure I get into uh, over at Almanac. It was I think they had it two years now, where they have brewers read Untapped reviews of their beers, <laughs> like read the one star reviews. The worst one we got was that they called us. It was actually like kind of a what do you call it? Like a shifty eyed compliment, a left handed. Oh yeah, yeah, backhanded, backhanded compliment. Yeah, backhanded yeah. compliment. <laughs> And it was, uh, they were, we are the homeless man's field work. And I was like, well, that's really being to homeless people. Yeah. But whatever, dude. <laughs> that's a weird, that is a, I'm not even sure if you can parse everything about, it's two words, and yet, it's so I, much. I, yeah, I, I took it as a compliment. Yeah. I'm someone like, with no tact. But whatever. Like, so we're, we're less expensive and not trendy? <laughs> and uh, no one wants us. Wait, hold on. It's like it sounds good, and then it sounds truly <laughs> terrible. Yeah. And also, the proper word is unhomed. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> I used to do a uh, political podcast for some reason. Okay. And, uh, second episode was like homelessness. How do you? <laughs> and I had an advocate like, no, it's unhomed. Just so we're clear <laughs> about it. Okay. There's a temporary condition. All right. Hopefully, ideally, a temporary condition. <laughs> But anyway, I had another very important thing to say, but I forgot what it was. Oh, yes, about dumping beers that didn't turn out right. Uh, I, uh, I got in with a brewery as they were opening. Um, and so one of their like first batches, it was like a porter, <laughs> didn't come out right. I think the same issue that you had, as you mentioned. Uh, and so they decided, instead of just dumping it and being, moving on, they decided to do a fundraiser for a local animal shelter by having a dunk tank where they put beer celebrities <laughs> Like people that owned homebrew shops, oh my God, like brilliant. sales reps, and had a dunk contest. I love that idea. That was super cool. We could definitely, we've got an open topped whirlpool. We could definitely do that yeah. with no sharp edges. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I mean, we seat- usually just use it as an after hours hot tub. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I am seated, got a really bad sunburn because it was like August, and I was just like, I'll be fine. This is going to take an hour, right? Oh, it's four hours? <laughs> Didn't plan. Woo. <laughs> So that was that was a lot of fun. Could be interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we all need to know this answer. How did you get into the nuclear realm? Like, was there like a passion as a child? Ha! No. <laughs> like, I, uh, I saw the money. My my, deg- <laughs> my degree is chemical engineering, and I graduated in uh, December of two thousand one, which is right after uh, September eleventh. Yep. So, there were hiring free like the. The job fair was empty. Like there was hiring freezes through throughout the industry um, that I was looking at. However, nuclear work doesn't stop for anything. Like it just it has to like it yeah. has to happen. And 
the there were jobs and they were like they were convenient and close by and paid okay and uh started doing that and was really good at it and just just kept going worked on nuclear submarines for a little bit wasn't really into the whole iraq war and working on things that shoot cruise missiles at villages so i quit doing that right and then uh 2005 is when i stopped and came out came out here to work for the original company um, in san jose working through them as a consulting firm but at ge nuclear when they were still in san jose and i just did that for a really like did that for a few years and then just started working for a different consulting firm doing the chemical side of things and the test facility design yeah finally quit in 2014 to open a brewery <laughs> i love that you're just like <sighs> finally yeah finally at just well, it's, I mean, I wake up loving work every day. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I think there's there's something to that. Like, just if you pursue your passion, hopefully it comes out where you can, like, sustain yourself as well from it. And, and like, um, I for a long time hated the jobs I was doing. I would come home miserable. I put on, uh, I went through a wonderful thing where I, uh, I uh, got broken up with, discovered beer, <laughs> and, and, like, had a job I hated. And I put on. So that breakup was a good thing. Well, I mean, kind of for the beer side, but I gained okay. 80 pounds in, like, no time. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. It was a bad, bad time. But now I'm, like, happy with what I have, you know? It's pretty cool. And uh, I think that's, it's my, it, like, the effects are everywhere when you don't like what you're doing. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. It just ruins everything. Like, my girlfriend has two jobs right now, and, like, one she clearly hates. And one she tolerates, I'm guessing. No, she loves the other one. Oh, okay. She loves the other one. I'm like, you should quit that other girl. Just quit the other one. Yeah. Because uh, we're both comedians. Okay. And she's much funnier than me. Uh, very <laughs> funny. Um, like, you know uh, Brian Regan? I don't know if you're a comedy fan. I love Brian Regan. Brian I've Regan. I saw him in Massachusetts. I'm from Connecticut. So. Cool, cool, cool. So, oh, I was born in Massachusetts. Right I moved when I was two months old, but hey, yeah, I got it. <laughs> uh, so he was in Sacramento like two weeks ago. And after a show, he came by the Sacramento Punchline just to see what was happening. And it was like a local showcase. My girlfriend was on it. And he like stopped her and told her how good she was. Aw. I was like, that's pretty cool. He's such we, a good dude. Yeah. And then we went back there. She had a show this Sunday. And like the manager was like, hey, come here. It's like, I went out with drinking with Brian afterwards. And he could not stop talking about how good you were. <laughs> that's crazy. That's awesome. To have like one of the best American comedians go and be like, hey, you're really good at this. She really needs to quit her other job. Right. I'm like, like quit the job you hate it. and just push comedy. Yeah. Like, just do what you love. It'll work out. Yeah. It's like, you need health insurance. You got through the other job. <laughs> Fucking go. And so um, I had like, we had to talk about it the other day. I'm like, look, when you come home from that one job, you are miserable. You barely say hi to me. And you just go to sleep. Like, we don't, it, it, it's literally killing our relationship as well. Like, you need to leave it. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of how you could possibly frame that that might, that might help. Because it sounds like she's resisting a little bit. She always is. She's, like, yeah. very, like, she's never quit a job. You know? Oh, dude, like, you got to do it. So feels great. She's like, I'm like, I'm like <laughs> you have to. Oh. Well, she did recently. She, was, she hadn't quit a job until December. And she's like, well, I need to get my two years there. I'm like, you, to, no, you, what does that mean to anybody? Yeah. It's like, well, it shows that I'm loyal. I'm like, just leave. Like, also, it's been, th we've been dating for three and a half years, so she's been there for five. Like, it's, you're past the two years. Just get out. Do so you have to submit your resume to get a comedy gig? Yeah, Is that right? How that works? Get, yeah, what so. are you doing? Just be like, Brian Regan thinks I'm funny, and just tell that to every booker, and you're. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're like, well. I, I know this is a little like you know off. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a little unconventional, but Brian Regan says I'm amazing. Yeah, and that's not just me. You can call the person who told me that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> who I mean, manages a comedy club, so he can vouch <laughs> for Brian Regan, and then you can call that person. He'll verify that if you want to call Brian, you can call Brian. Like I don't know, <laughs> put me on your show. <laughs> What's your girlfriend's name? Uh, Becky Lynn. Okay. Yeah. Cool. A little, little plug. Yeah. Yeah. She's well known on the podcast. If I don't have a oh. guest, I usually throw her on it. I'm awesome, like, awesome. There we go. And then she outs me for all the terrible things I do in our relationship. It's a lot of fun. Great. So go back and listen to the time that I didn't know my grandma's name. Not true. I just blanked for a second. <laughs> I'm like, look, she has every her name is grandma. Every you grandma has a nickname, and then you kind of forget because you're always using the nickname. What do you want me to do? I feel you. Yeah. <laughs> I knew. I just didn't remember for the important time. <laughs> so yeah. So, uh, do you have more beer questions? Oh, um, more beer questions. Well, I did want to talk about Mary J. Pride for a second. Okay. 
Now, uh, I was told by staff that there's something in this beer. Yes. There's not typically in an IPA. Correct. What is it? I forgot. Pride. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, it's like, I don't want to do this. No, it's, it's obligatory a, IPAs. <laughs> no, it's a, that beer came about because a very loyal and frequent customer over at Black Hammer was cutting down their rosemary bush. That's it. <laughs> and uh, she said, do you want some rosemary for a beer? It's all organic. It's never used pesticides or backyard. I said, sure. You know. And she brought in a 50-gallon garbage bag of rosemary. <laughs> but we weren't ready to brew the beer, so we went and did a, uh, an ethanol extraction to pull the rosemary. The, uh, basically, we made a, what do you call it, a bitters with the rosemary. Oh, nice. And used that bitters to flavor the beer. Um, and made sure that the volume we added didn't raise the alcohol by anything more than less than 0.1%, so it stays under the radar. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that beer came out really good. I'm very happy with yeah, it. Yeah, it is very good. And I think we, we ended up with enough of it to make two batches, and one was a year ago, and this is the next batch. Because, I mean, once you go and soak rosemary and ethanol, it's, it's stable. Nice. So, and actually, the, that straight ethanol is pretty good. I had a little, yeah, adding water to it. That sounds very strange. To make it 80 proof. It, well, it tasted like rosemary bitters. It's <laughs> super drinkable. So yeah. we're going to expand to the bitters business if we get bored. Oh. If we get bored of this, but I don't see that happening yeah. anytime soon. Well, because you could get into like cocktail game. Yeah, but. but then, uh, you have to get like a whole just other be, licensing. Just keep and being good at what we do. Right. Well, let seven stills keep the corner on the, uh, the brewery slash distillery market. Yeah. We're having too much fun with this place. So. Yeah. <laughs> so what, I guess uh, since you're kind of doing classical styles of beer, what do you see as far as like new trends that you think will come up in the future on, on beer? Oh, we're going to be moving to lagers. This IP, IPAs, always. they're fun. The future is always Pilsners and never Pilsners. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that, but it's funny. <laughs> Every year they tell you it's, this is the year of the lager. It's going to be Pilsners. You should make a Pilsner. It's going to sound like hotcakes and... Uh, it never takes off. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Yeah, well, Americans are slow learners. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. I always, for like the last four years, I'm like, this year, Berliner Weiss has taken off. Oh, we and sell a lot year. of Berliner Weiss, but... Right. I'd say here, we so people come in here, and because uh, we serve as basically, basically any beer under, I think it's 7%, we serve in Steins. Nice. Generally. Um, eight percent in a half liter serving size gets to be a little bit squirrely. Yeah, so we keep it. Uh, but people see Steins, and they definitely order more German uh, style beers here than at our other. Well, we used to have two more locations, but at, now just back at the brewery. I don't know if it's going to be the year of the lager, but we sell it, more and more. Yeah, it never is, but like, there's little incremental bumps. Which is so crazy because, like, the biggest beers in the world are lagers. When it comes to craft beer, I think there's, like, this, like, I don't want to drink lagers because that's what my dad drank. Okay. And now it's probably my granddad. I think everybody's dad's drinking craft beer now. <laughs> well, I mean, I, people, they're, craft beer is super popular, but not every craft beer drinker is at the same stage of a craft beer uh, progression or evolution. Because right. we, people's tastes evolve over time. For sure. Right? Like, sours were the rage, I don't know, what, three years ago? Four years ago? They're yeah. not. They're still popular, but, eh. There's still, they're still a massive barrier for most people that don't have experience with them. You know, one bad sour, and you never want to drink another one. Agreed. But, what, what, so what I'm saying, like, say with sours. Uh, and there's a lot of people who are still just getting into sours. But, the, like, the those of us have been really into craft beer for a long time, because I've been... I have since, I don't know, I think I had a Sam Adams Boston Lager was the first craft beer. I didn't have a Pete's Wicked. Fun fact, Pete Slosberg of Pete's Wicked is from, well, he's older than me, so I'm from his hometown (laughs) of Norwich, Connecticut. Oh. And he grew up on Benedict Place, named after Benedict Arnold. But (laughs) but you should trust Pete. He's not like Benedict Arnold. Um, But anyway, uh, and... Very quickly, like I moved through uh, dark porters and stouts, and I was done with those eight years ago. Yeah. Just done. 
and they hadn't even taken off yet. And I just like, also, I get bored quickly. But uh, the evolution of beer drinkers is, and you can also see it in subsets of the population. I think people who are really into beer right now, they like IPAs, but they also love good lagers. Yeah. Right? And you can find these different subsets in different neighborhoods in San Francisco. <laughs> because we had a location towards the marina, and people would just come in, and only there do people come in and say, I just want an IPA. Because <laughs> they're, they're on the, tra- the trailing edge yeah. of the evolution. So, lagers are coming. I don't think it's this year. It's in the next couple. It's a slow build. It's like a lapping waves, not big waves. Yeah. I think serving one liter steins is going to help. Yeah, because you don't put an IPA in that. Nobody's no. going to be like, I need a stein up IPA. It's just not, it doesn't, it sounds wrong. Yeah, it's, it does. You're right. Like, you're like, I would like a stein of, like, a Bach. When you order a stein, you want to, you want to say Bach. You want to say pills. Like, you want to say those words. <laughs> when you're like, can I get a stein True. of, yeah, can I get a stein of a hazy? It doesn't sound right. <laughs> it sounds I agree. Terrible. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I was, uh, you were talking about how you kind of move past stouts and porters real quick. But it's an easy entry beer because it's got all those familiar flavors. You got chocolate, you got coffee. It's an oh yeah, easy diet. Definitely. In. And I've kind of found like maybe not the new beer drink, craft beer drinkers, but like you know, ten years ago, your entries were those two, or they were like Belgians. Agreed. And now, totally. nobody wants a Belgian. There's like no section of the world that's looking for a Belgian, which is super weird. Well. We sell more Sparkle Pony than any other beer. I mean, it's a great name. Also, very solid beer. Yeah. I am really enjoying it. Uh, I've, it's been a long time since I've had a Belgian. And so I was like, my, my brain's like, hey, remember this? This is like one of your first favorites. <laughs> this is everything that you used to love. And I still do. I just, like, I don't seek it out anymore. Yeah. But a lot of Belgians really go down the slightly cloying flavor profile. Yes. And I think it was a... Uh, I'm trying to. Was it Charlie Bamforth? I think it's Charlie Bamforth who can't who uses a another metric of beer flavor besides like aroma, mouthfeel, flavor. Right? It's moreness, 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 <laughs> and that when you're done swallowing a sip, wanting more. That's yeah. And like the reason that Sparkle Pony is so dry for a Belgian. Yes. is to turn the Mornis dial up a little bit. <laughs> because I started with a recipe, like a, a clone recipe for Leffa Blonde. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if you remember, if you've had Leffa I lately. Have. Yeah, I had it about a year ago. That's l- lately, right? I personally can only, like, I drink one of those and I'm good. Yeah. Unless it's the only beer I've got, and then I'll drink more than one. Yeah. But just because it's it's so, it's so sweet on the finish and it doesn't have that Mornis. Yeah. So It has that cloying. Yeah, yeah. coat your tongue with sugar. And yeah, like it's like, and it's. I think it's due to like lack of minerality and also just the BUG ratio, you know, bitterness to gravity. Okay, being a little bit low for, I think, drinkers around here. Yeah, Belgians love sweet though. So yeah. Oh, the good one's so good. Agreed. So good. Like this one makes me want to go home and like I know I have some in my like. Uh, What's it called? Cellar, but it's not a cellar. Let's call it a cellar. It's a, it's a, it's a cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> An attic? No, I wish yeah. it's a cabinet. <laughs> okay, the lowest cabinet in the house. That's it. But, Do you yeah. have anything super special in that in that cabinet? Somebody gave me a, a Westville Terran Twelve for, like, I did a show at their venue, and they're like, "Thanks for doing this," and they handed me that. I'm like, "You're this is not. Why are you doing this? I mean, I'll take it." <laughs> But is there is there a hitch? Why did you do that? Like, <laughs> it's very exciting. I don't know who I'm going to drink it with. Uh, I got to figure that out. I'd and say, wait, does your girlfriend like beer? Yeah, she loves it. There you go. She say, doesn't. hey, after you quit this job, yeah, <laughs> let's celebrate. But she hates stouts and uh, Belgians. Well, then yeah, don't waste it. On it's her. yeah, I hate it. I have like <laughs> my whole cellar is just things I can't drink with her. I was like, well, I don't want to drink 22 ounces of something by myself, especially like a 13 percent barrel aged stout. Like what? Yeah. Who's drinking that alone? I mean, people. I feel but, you. <laughs> but at, at this age, you just can't be doing that anymore. No, definitely not. <laughs> so I got to plan these big events. I'm like, I don't want people in my house. <laughs> you could just re-gift it, except then you might not get some. Yeah, I, so. I do try. <gasps> re-gift it, but open it first. 
That's a terrible way. <laughs> it's like, Ksh. I got this for you. Yeah, it's like, I, it, I just opened this. I dr- opened it, drank half of it, and then I drove to your house <laughs> to hand it to you. <laughs> Not an ideal setup, I don't think. But maybe it's an avenue I pursue. What happens when somebody headlines a comedy show and it's their first time on stage? Coming July 31st to the San Francisco Punchline, I think I'd be good at that. Five comedians help a newcomer write jokes and learn how to take the stage to headline a show. Featuring comedians Mean Day, Gabby Pochia, Clay Newman, Justin Lockwood, and Samantha Gilwhite. And featuring newcomer Newark City Councilman Mike Bucci. I Think I'd Be Good at That has been selling out shows all over California and featured as part of SF Sketchfest. Catch it July 31st at the San Francisco Punchline. Tickets available, punchlinecomedyclub.com, or find half-off tickets on Goldstock. I know you said earlier that uh, that the Boston Lager is kind of your first craft beer. What really got you, like, driven to, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open a brewery? Like, oh, well, what so- was that key? So I started brewing, I think, before I was 21. I think I was 20. So 96. And uh, was like, I was one of the founding members of the um, University of Connecticut Zymergy Club. Nice. Or chemical, or grad, the grad students in chemical engineering uh, started, started this club with us. or We helped them start this club to brew beer. And the student government bought us a really nice um, half-barrel brewing setup. Like, it was wonderful, um, and started brewing then. Then, kind of took a hi- hiatus for a while, just due to graduating college and getting busy. <laughs> and then uh, moved out here, and then started bre- a buddy of mine like had some old brewing equipment from a friend of his, and started brewing again. And really just got. I lived in a house like a social network house in Mountain View, yeah. and we'd have parties three four nights a week it was it was crazy it was fun it, it was, was getting crazy. expensive you're like well I, I can cut costs <laughs> oh yeah so what we did is uh like i didn't i got, i i went and you know upgraded the brewing setup got a kegerator and we made beer ingredients one of the like the utilities so we'd have you know pg and e at&t <laughs> propane <laughs> malt and hops <laughs> And CO2. Yeah. As line items, really, on, on the spreadsheet for the house. <laughs> I like you guys have a spreadsheet that's... Oh, of course. That's very engineering. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I mean, my roommates worked at TiVo and Apple and Google, so... <laughs> yeah, it was a... It was like the social network. Um, but, uh, yeah, it just got really into it. And because of all the parties, had a lot of ability to go and uh, hone my skills because I had to brew relatively frequently to keep up with demand. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew I wanted to open a business and a buddy of mine and I were, uh, Andy Barron, a good friend of mine, was were brewing beer in the backyard and he says, uh, you know, you should open a brewery. I was like, shit, you're right. <laughs> and then thought about it a little more and realized like within, by the next day, yep, that's what I need to do. And that was like, that was 2000, I want to say eight, seven 2007 2008 and then just kept working on it and entering as many contests as i could to hone my skills and like build up credibility to uh, get investors uh or help you know convince investors to go and write me large checks <laughs> and then uh was able to quit my job in 2014 uh my cousin through marriage uh, kevin jackie is my primary business partner to help me found black hammer and uh, we opened in 2015, and it worked. Nice. It was amazing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's incredibly fun. I still, like, use all my, like, a lot of the things I learned in college on a day-to-day basis. It's really kind of fun. What's well, been uh, the thing you didn't expect about getting into the beer industry? Like, kind of blindsided you, or it was, like, a pleasant surprise? Oh. Because I imagine you did all your research about, like, how to go into the business, like, what the regulations are going to be, uh, you know, the city going, hey, you can't do this with the permits and all that garbage. Like, was there oh. anything that kind of blindsided you? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd say the expense. You know, like, the numbers always look, they looked a lot better <laughs> before we opened. Um, 
but uh, and actually finding a location was brutal. That took a long time. That was a, that was a year and a half, maybe. Um, um, but yeah, yeah, finding a space was was, was incredibly challenging um, and surprising how hard that was. Like I thought it would just be, be, you know, look at a few warehouses and pick one, but yeah. it was not like that at all. It's like the na- navigating the nuances of zoning was took a while but uh and then in terms of like good blindsided i didn't realize how collaborative and helpful other breweries were oh yeah Yeah. i mean you know without without being without opening a brewery it's kind of you don't realize oh no it's just like a bunch of home brewers really (laughs) same people same attitudes it's pretty rad yeah because like back before that big boom you know, five, six, seven years ago, it was all professional breweries going out on their like brewers going out on their own and starting new breweries. And then like two thousand nine, two thousand ten, people like, you know what? I think I can do this too. I don't think I need to have worked at you know Pizza Port to go start a brewery. Oh I think, God, no! I think I could figure it out. Yeah, that that that, that was actually. I didn't know that until I was at one of the uh, California Craft Brewing Association meetings. And I was just asking some brewery, relatively new brewery owners, like, you know, well, how did you learn to brew on professional brewing equipment? Yeah. And they're like, oh, dude, it's easy. It's like, they're just way better tools. It's just like home brewing, but it's easier. Yeah. And they're absolutely right. It's so much easier than home brewing. Like, home brewing, everything wants to go wrong at all times. <laughs> really, it's like, it's like you built a sailboat out of an inner tube and, like, a sheet and some sticks, and you're trying to actually sail. And it's like, this is not working. And then you get an actual sailboat. You're like, oh. Sailing's freaking easy. Yeah, it's so easy. The sailboat wants to sail. Yeah. Brewery, if you, like professional if you have brewing. wind, you're good to go. Yeah, professional brewing equipment wants to brew beer. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, that was pretty neat. Um, and, yeah, I still don't understand. There, and I'm like, I'm, there's no way I would ever name names. But there's still people out there making bad beer on commercial equipment. And I think it's got to be stubbornness. I still haven't figured out how it, how it's a thing. But Yeah. And... And I don't mean subjectively bad beer that, like, I personally just don't like. Objectively, like, this shouldn't be available to a consumer. Yeah. and, and Like, it has easily recognizable flaws yes. as a beer. Yeah. I noticed that when I went to the CBC for the first time. And there's a, uh, a hospitality suite. And it, there was, like, there were obvious flaws. Like, like obvi- really? Oh, At just- the CBC? Like, oh, we got some guest beers in here. And there were... Oh god, yeah. Oh no. I mean, someone. Yeah, someone Who's vetting this? No one. We need a new system. The there, system is broken. Oh, there's <laughs> no vetting. Are you kidding? That's, I don't know. Okay, hospitality running, like we have a beer. Do you want to try it's it? It's a CBC. It's a CBC, right? You have a hospitality suite. They're like, who wants to come and like donate a bunch of beer and do this? And there's a mm. sign up sheet. <laughs> like, I see. And you have to bring this much beer. People are like, I want to go do that. Okay. That's it. Yeah. So, really CBC is really fun. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's a, like, like willing and able or just willing. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. So, it's, it's weird how people that aren't good at it really push, like, I need to get recognized. And, like, ah, oh, man, I, just, I don't want to go on any kind of rants here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> rants are fun. Yeah. I just, uh, I don't know. If, for me, I've been, like, going to breweries for 12 years or whatever it is you know um like actively like trying like oh what what does this guy got going on and uh, you can always tell a person like it's weird how uh bad beer is tied to like an impersonal interest in the industry okay like very few passionate people make bad beer yeah there's people like craft beer is a thing it's a way to make money i'm gonna get involved in that here's a terrible product (laughs) like I, it's just like very rare do I see like a person with passion who's there for like I I just love beer making bad beer. Oh yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, it's I think it's those that have checked out, but you yeah. know it's gonna happen. Well, I mean, it is, oh, I I know it blindsided me the cruel just like unbelievably untapped reviews just blew my mind. Where. Like it, with an objectively good beer that wins awards, getting untapped reviews, and people's giving it one star, saying this beer's terrible, or I wouldn't serve this to my enemies. <laughs> it's like which uh, I said on my last podcast. I forget what beer it was. I was like, I wouldn't serve it to my worst enemy. Oh, a bad mosaic IPA. That's right. 
Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I don't like it. Uh, <laughs> you mean the hot mosaic? Yeah. yeah. Generally, really. What do you like about general. mosaic? I don't know. I just feel like it makes it makes enough bad beers. Like so many beers, I'm like something's wrong with this IPA. They're like, well, I'm like, what hops are in there? Like mosaic. I'm like, every time that's the that's the common thread. Okay. And I'm just like, I don't think it plays well with every hop. And I also know Agreed. I also don't think it's a good primary hop. So like, it's like we're gonna focus on mosaic. Now I've had some delicious primarily mosaic beers, but I feel like a lot of people screw it up. I don't know how. You're just throwing the one kind of hop in, but there's ones that are just like undrinkable swill. I mean, it might also just be uh, different lots of mosaic. That's right? also Cause, possible. Because like some mosaic, it's very blueberry forward. Yeah. Like we had, a, we were lucky with our double dry hopped ascendance. That was just, it really tasted like blueberries. Rad is that beer? Yeah. Is rad, but they weren't. <laughs> yeah, and that's I think because it, it can go so many ways. Also, so like the fact that it can go into a bad direction, you know, there's also possibly like you said blueberry like but also onion what <laughs> why is that a possibility in a beer i'm just going and getting two little summer mixtapes to come over here it's a it's a hazy that we've got oh i don't think it has mosaic in it i'm not trying to prove you wrong i'm just no no i'm not going to say it's like a gar- like never use it okay. i believe it can be used properly oh, i would just say don't tell me how to party so Hey, and I say this every time. You don't have to agree with me. I'm not. It's beer. You, I can be. You don't have to agree with my opinion. It's an opinion. I just approach them hesitantly. We all have preferences. Hey, I hated Galaxy when I first tasted Galaxy. I was like, I don't know why anyone likes this hop. And kind of with you. (laughs) I don't hate it now. Yeah. But I've had some good Galaxy beers. But I don't know. Had this funky, funkiness to it. Yeah. I don't know if it looks tastes better now because it's fifty five bucks a pound. <laughs> <laughs> if it's sort of like you know the diamond phenomenon, but it's, it really like galaxy. It's like well, I wonder if it is like diamonds. I wonder if there's massive hordes of galaxy held by one family in Australia and they're just <laughs> meeting it out to drive the price up and convincing everyone that galaxy is valuable, like Maybe. De Beers. Yeah, possibly. Hopefully, yeah. De Beers doesn't listen to this podcast because I might have a hit on me. But yeah, they're doing fine. I think they'll be all right. No. Uh, <laughs> well, I hear the diamond industry is failing, and that's great. Uh, I can't tell you a friend of mine that's recently been engaged who'd spend money on a diamond, so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't either. Also, I heard marriage is going away. It's a whole thing. Nobody's doing that anymore. Uh, These are just the rumors I'm hearing from the internet. If there's tax benefits, lies. I'm in. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Heather. So, cheers. cheers. This is a uh, summer mixtape. And oh, okay. uh, I'll be able to tell you what's in it in a second. <laughs> I amazingly don't have all 190 of our recipes memorized. What? I know, no, right? That is insane. It is... Oh. It, it's got some mosaic in there. Yeah. So if you hate it, I get it. <laughs> uh, it's a Chinook and mosaic. Oh, no. So. I love Chinook. It's a great hop. Classic hop. Definitely. Give me those classics. Especially if you love grapefruit. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. I enjoy this quite a bit. Because I'm not an asshole. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a terrible hop. It's just not an inconsistent hop. Oh, I'm not trying to convince yeah. you that your mosaic aversion is wrong. Right. I actually wasn't even sure there was mosaic in it. <laughs> so have you, have you been uh, – do you f- – I assume you hear about hop prices. I'm guessing you don't follow yeah. the loop. Have you heard of Lupulin Exchange I've, or Lupulin I've, Exchange? It's come up. It's like a trading site because the price is so high. Like, hey, I have extras – that you could buy off of me is that basically yeah I look at it every day like really like, I don't wake up and look at the New York Stock Exchange I, look, I wake up and I look at the Lublin Exchange because you got that's your business yeah well hot prices are just beyond they're weird. insane they, they just the past 12 months everything went insane yeah like, I, I apparently before I was in the business this happened with Simcoe yes um, but I was not in business so I don't I can't really speak to that but now I am and say, you know, Galaxy, which debuted as a normal 12 or so hot prices, normal, uh, I'd say aroma hops, right? Normal meaning say, oh, there is, there's no normal anymore. Right. Like, but like El Dorado, El Dorado's $13 a pound. Mosaic right now it's at about 15. It was at 12 last fall. Citra was at 
12 last year. It's really? now 40 if you can get it. Yeah, it used to. So we went down to 12 for a while. Cause I remember like a couple of years ago it was like 40. Mm -hmm. And now it's down to 12, then it's back up. Yeah, it's back up. Nice. <laughs> so it's awful for you guys, but. <laughs> well, it's we just use other hops. Yeah, I mean, right. we, like when I see a, salt, a good citrus price, I'll buy a bunch of it. But yeah. um, I don't think. because So we focus. Uh, Black Hammer, our vision since the, before we even. While we were working on our business plan, our vision has been to open a brewery and because we love to go and uh, provide an experience it's not just about the beer um we like to go and that's why we have bill common and uh, you know try and sell that room and and yes there's been questions that is a real living wall behind me um but uh our goal has been to open five different tasting room experience experiences so the right? homeless field work exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so we've that's been our goal from the beginning, and because of that, we don't work on having a lot of channels of say uh, summer mixtape. Yeah. So we can make summer mixtape a little bit different the next time. Not really that big a deal. Like it's it's not like you're going to go and grab another container of it because there aren't any <laughs> to compare it to, yeah. and it'll be close. It'll be a a fruity dank, hazy IPA, kind of leaning, towing the line. Really, it's kind. Of, I, I consider yeah. it kind of both. I, right? I feel like yeah, the fruit just barely overpowers the dankness. Like, yes, it's very balanced between those two. That's why it's called summer mixtape. Nice, but uh, plus it's summer. <laughs> I'd love to go and like take some actual cassettes and be like, oh, this is the actual summer mixtape, and include it with the beer. <laughs> oh, that would be so. Cool. And it'll have um, never going to give you up on it, and I'll just rickroll <laughs> everyone. Yeah, I uh, I made a post the other day. Uh, I was like, everybody knows Independence Day is July 4th. Everybody knows that. But when is Codependence Day? July 27th. When Never Gonna Give You Up was released as a single. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was, I like literally like Googled, like, when did that come out? I don't know why I decided that was a song that singles Codependence, but you know, it kind of does. Never gonna come around to desert you. Uh, I, I, think like, it, I think it sounds more like just hey, stop, don't worry. I'm not going to leave you no matter what. Right. I don't feel it's very codependent, but in the moment. Um, also, I, I checked my whole internet thing. I'm like, oh, I was drunk because I don't really do a lot of social media stuff. I don't like comment on posts. But I was like, I was like why do I have like nine plus thing? I'm like, what? I'm like, oh, no, I was on one last night. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're a, little, you're a chatty Kathy. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, everything's, everything in my head has to go out in the world. And like that happens like once every like three months. I just go nuts. <laughs> So that's what that came from. I don't know why I chose that song. I decided that was a song. And then people are like, are you Rick rolling me? I'm like, I don't think so. I just thought for a moment, Codependent song might be that song. <laughs> An accidental like, Rick roll. It's not really a Rick roll, is it? Yeah. I'm like, so I just, just like that song, man. Yeah. Never going to give you up. Like, just always around. That's pretty codependent. <laughs> but maybe it's just love. Could just be love. I don't know. Anyway, if you guys I don't know, to... man, I've been single for a while, so it's, it's hard to actually uh, think about what's codependent and what's not. Right. So, it's a very thin line. <laughs> codependency is in the eye of the codependent. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're just we're independent people, living together, and never apart. But independent, we could leave. We just choose to stay. <laughs> can leave I, at I, any I, time. I could. I could go out with that my chain friends. is symbolic yeah <laughs> i could go out with my friends i just chose not to every night for like a three months straight <laughs> i don't know i don't even i'm not even sure the definition anymore of codependence at this point oh completely apart from that did you <laughs> have you heard of bob lazar the name sounds familiar this has nothing to do with beer but Great. it's the most mind-blowing thing i've heard in recent history and okay. i don't even know what to think of it spill it Bob Lazar, I think it's L-A-Z-A-R. That's what I assume. He's the engineer who, well, alleged engineer who told the world about Area 51 in the 80s. Okay. And he was on... Is that only the 80s? Yeah. He was I, on Joe Rogan. I always imagine Area 51 was like 1947. They're like, hey, aliens. Was it the 80s? I was driving, and my friend and co-pilot was... was Doing the uh, the Wikipedia, -ing. okay. <laughs> so uh, 
She said it was the 80s. I mean, I, I haven't checked. I was born in the 80s. I have no frame of reference. I just imagined that's the truth. Right? Yeah. But I'm probably wrong. Bob Lazar was on Joe Rogan about a week ago talking about his experiences in Area 51. And actually, there was nine spacecraft. And he's touched one. And working, researching, and, you know, on the anti-gravity drives. Listening to this man talk. He talks as convincingly as I was. If I was telling you about the equipment in the brewery, and as you know, just believable yeah. as I am, and because I, you've experienced, like you yeah. can experience that if you wanted. To. And I wouldn't tell the story differently any time, right? I could tell you the arrangement of the equipment and like how I got each piece, and I would never screw up because it's the truth. That's how Bob Lazar talks about. It was a three-hour podcast. He talks about his time researching alien spacecraft and Area Fifty-One for the government, and it's. I don't know what to make of it. Like, if it was on April 1st, I would know not to believe it. But it's... It's it's very interesting. Now, so it was a couple of weeks ago. What if they recorded on April 1st, and then they just put live underneath, and it is an April Fool's joke, but it's also made to look like it's not an April Fool's joke. Well, then they got me. I'm all about conspiracy. <laughs> I'm not actually about conspiracy theories, but I love them. For the simple fact that, like, uh, they're insane. Like, most conspiracy theories are insane. But if you boil them down to their essence, like, every conspiracy theory is like, hey, um, rich people don't like poor people. And we're like, <laughs> yeah, we know. We, yeah. we know that. <laughs> you don't need to have a conspiracy. You're just like, you can just go to the street corner and go, rich people don't like poor people. And they have all the power. And we're like, yeah, rich people I, don't I'm like poor people. Yeah, rich people don't like poor people and politicians like money. Yeah. It's, it's what it always boils down to at the end of the day. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like... I mean, you could go insane looking at all the coincidences, or you just be like, let's say facts. This is what it is. Because that's your conclusion every time. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. Sometimes those rich people are also turtles. I, Whatever the case may be. What the, is it? There's a... Oh, there's Mitch McConnell. Got it. The reptiles that control the world, you know? What? Oh, uh, the reptilian people are secretly the rich people. You haven't heard that one? No. It's all reptiles. Okay. Alien reptiles. Why reptiles? Because they're cold blooded, blue yeah, blooded. What's I, the? They can survive, but they can't if it's too. I don't understand the. But apparently, alien reptiles. Dinosaurs. Is this... Embodying humans. The, the I elite. Know. I don't know. It I doesn't have understand. to do with dinosaurs, right? Because dinosaurs aren't actually reptiles. Dinosaurs I, are more like they're birds. Yeah. So. I don't know why. I just know that that's like. A, theory and it's very strange okay. and I don't know why it matters that they're I reptiles know. and if they're an alien reptile are they really a reptile it's just you know what let's forget we, like I said at the end of the day rich people hate poor people have all the power <laughs> <laughs> it, the, the other stuff doesn't matter uh, I love conspiracy theories they're great because <laughs> <laughs> they're a waste of time <laughs> yeah they're a uh... But where do you stand on aliens? Do they exist? Oh, I thought you were going to say, where do I stand on rich people hitting poor people? I'm like, uh, <clears throat> I'm okay. <laughs> I don't really hate poor people. Well, there's, there's the, I wouldn't say I'm rich either. So. Right, exactly. What, what constitutes Well, not rich? I'm rich in terms of life. Yes, I'm but, uh, spiritually fulfilled. But do you think the aliens are real? Having heard Bob uh, Lazar? Okay, yes. Yeah, so... Where do you Alien, say so, pre, pre Lazar, post Lazar? We, we, we talk about real. <laughs> Aliens definitely exist. Right. The Drake equation. Are you familiar with the Drake equation? I am. Because awesome. there's this band from Chicago called Tub Ring. All of their <laughs> albums are based around scientific principles. Perfect. Yeah. So, so zoo hypothesis. If anyone's listening, they don't know what the Drake equation That's is. That's actually a good point. The Drake equation is, uh, it's not by Sir Francis Drake. It's by a different scientist. Well, Sir Francis Drake was an explorer, but a different uh, a scientist. I forget his first name, last name Drake. Who Bob Drake? Is it Bob Drake? I don't know. Yeah. Let's call him Bob. <laughs> he compiled a an equation based on the the likelihood of a bunch of different factors, right? And say, all right, well, this like life appeared on Earth in this many years, and you know, given this the the rareness of the Earth as a planet that appeared in this many years, and then so you end up with all these very small fractions, right? 
then multiplied those very small fractions, which are all the probabilities of life occurring, times the number of planets in the in the uh, in an average solar system, right? Right? Or planet? I don't know. If it's called the solar system. It's not the sun. It's, I don't think it is because <laughs> soul is our star. So a planetary system, right? right? Rotating around a star times the number of stars in a galaxy times the number of galaxies in the universe, and you actually end up with. Yeah, life is inevitable. We, it is inevitable. We definitely, there are. There's definitely life. If there's one, oh my the, god, yeah. the odds, the odds for there being only one are so infinitesimally small. It's impossible. There has to be two. It, it's and like that's monkeys like, writing that's, Shakespeare. That's, that's like try. guaranteed. Three guaranteed. Like, and then four. I mean, maybe, maybe we're pushing it with. There's four different. But I don't think we are. I think. No, I think I think there's thousands and yeah, thousands. Like, like, yeah. But yeah. space is so big and ever expanding. Whether or not we've encountered one, I don't know what those odds right. are. How far away are they? Because they could be and, on, and, on and time wise, right? right? It's not just how far away. It's like, well, did we evolve along the same evolutionary timelines to communicate? Because right. if you look at you know what percentage of Earth's lifespan humans have been around. If, it's, Earth, if our Earth's lifetime is a year, we're at like seconds to midnight right, right now at the end of December 31st. Right. So we haven't been on the planet very long. long. Yeah. So it's like all of a sudden we're like, oh, we're awake. Anyone okay. out there? And the odds of us actually. Yeah. But they also could have been watching us this whole time. We never would have known. Yeah. It's nuts. Ants don't know that we're watching them. Yeah. We wouldn't know that an alien life form is watching yeah. us. Like imagine like, so the Big Bang, boom, everything spatters out, right? And, like, what if, like, one in 70 of those had life at that moment? Like, boom, and then, like, life forms within, like, milliseconds. Like, one in 70. But they've been expanding for millions of years, so they're so far apart. They never see each other by the time, like, intelligent life shows up. Like, multicellular organisms. Yeah. It's just, to say that it's not possible is, is an insanity to me. Yeah, it's definitely possible. It's yeah. The, the question is: Is the density of worlds in our universe high enough in our in the human species lifespan for us to encounter another one? I don't think it is. But we might encounter evidence of another one that may have right. existed earlier. Right, because of how light travels and it's a whole. Thing. We might just see a spaceship go by and go. What the fuck was that? I'm like, that and that would be it. Twenty million years ago, and we'll Good spend the, we'll spend the rest of humanity trying to figure out what that thing was that just went by, <laughs> and it was just like a rocket that they like lost control of, and it was like yeah. chung, <laughs> <laughs> zipping through our like through our solar system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if but if uh, Mr. Lazar is to be believed, there is a contact in some way, shape, or form. The only reason I don't. I have not to believe Bob Lazar is that no one is corroborating certain. Some people do. Co- wait, I think some people are corroborating certain elements of his story that he did do and take a bunch of friends at the predicted. T- he, he, he asserts that we have flown these spacecraft. OK, we mean humans. Right. Um, and like Independence Day. Sure, I only saw that once, so I don't really... Okay. <laughs> um, so he knew when the scheduled fl- flight tests were going to be at an area, not at Area 51, but like somewhere else in Nevada, and took some friends down to the side of the road, and they could see these... They're not called UFOs anymore. They're called like anomalous flying... No, something like that. It's not UFOs. No. UAPs. Okay. Unidentified aerial phenomena. Okay. Because we don't know weather balloons. Because we don't know if they're objects, right? It could be like a plasma or something. Right. So that that actually makes sense. Uh, and took them there in the thing in the the thing they saw the things that they couldn't explain what they were at the exact time or at the time he said allegedly. (laughs) So I don't know. I because. Something I just read today. I'm ready for it. Which is not news. Okay. In 19... I want to say it's 86. It could have been 96. A, a journalist 
exposed the CIA's uh, operation of selling massive quantities. They enlisted the help of a bunch of uh, cocaine traffickers mm -hmm. to sell massive quantities of cocaine, uh, to smuggle massive quantities of cocaine into the United States and sell them to get money to, you know, the, the Iran contra, or not yeah. the, no, uh, this is different. I think yeah. this is the Nicaraguan yeah. rebels, right? Yes. So the CIA, this is a, no, this is a fact. This happened. The CIA enlisted the help of a whole slew of cabal, uh, a cabal of drug traffickers <laughs> to bring in unforeseen quantities of cocaine into the United States to sell it, to finance um, dissidents in Nicaragua to topple the regime there. And this journalist exposed this. I want to say 96. I think it was Between 96. those two years, I want to say 96 because, like, that was, like, 84. Yeah. Turned Coca around so quick would be incre incredible. Yeah, it was 96. Yeah. And he was right. This actually happened. Yeah. Like, it's absolutely it, – it's completely unbelievable, and it actually happened. Is it and his career was – so – but his career was ruined from this. Yeah. Like, he didn't – He can't – He died. Yeah. Like, they, they, they called blower. it a suicide. Yep. But we've all seen this game. Played. It was like two shots in the head and they call it a suicide. How do you shoot the second shot? Yeah. You're like, bam. Oh, I'm still alive. Let's try yeah. that again. Well, I mean, to be fair, not every bullet through the head is going to be an instantaneous death. But also, come on. No, <laughs> no way. No way. He was killed. Yeah. Like, just no. Yeah, I like Doesn't the, pass the smell test. Yeah. yeah. No, not at all. So shit like that happens. And that's a much smaller deal than studying alien spacecraft. Yeah. Like, that's just like some like stupid pre... Not pre that's some stupid like, you know, junior high school stuff for a government to do. Yeah. Compared to we have spacecraft and we're studying them but we didn't tell you. Yeah. And like that, those people have restricted access. They're there all the time. They're not... Like, for them to uh, pass away... Through like a health issue, because they're deprived of sunlight for hours at a time, probably not exercising. It's not unusual. Oh, Jim had a heart attack at fifty-six, but did he? I'm sure our government can induce a heart attack yeah, in a right. in, in a citizen without getting caught. Right? Like, come on. Let's yeah, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so with Bob Lazar, it's like I hear the guy talk. You know, I, I was an engineer. For, I'm still an engineer. Once an engineer, always an engineer. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, with like a real, an engineer in nuclear power plants, like watching Chernobyl was chilling to me. Oh my god, I haven't Chernobyl. gone in yet. That's unbelievable. But, but like, that's the world and the people that I worked with, right? And in the military, like I, I worked with the Navy on nuclear submarines. I like uh, met with uh, I forget his name, his admiral. It's not like Kraken, but he was tough to deal with, but, and I had secret clearance because I worked on nuclear submarines. You have to have secret clearance to, to go on aboard a nuclear submarine as a uh, civilian. Mm -hmm. And I've been in that world and I can definitely see one, no one corroborating and talking about it because, well, one, everyone's sworn to secrecy. Like you're not allowed to talk about it. Bob Lazar is breaking the rules and I, and the government would if they arrested him, they would be legitimizing what he's saying. Right. Right. You just let it, you let the one rogue go out. Yeah. And they're like, nobody corroborates that. We're going to be fine. Yep. He's just a kooky guy. If we, if we did anything to him, it would, yeah, like you said, corroborate what he's saying implicitly. Yeah. So just like, let the one kooky guy be the kooky guy. And people who want to take it, take that as fact, they can. But we know most people will be like, nobody else is saying this. This is just a crazy crackpot. Yeah, and that's how you that's how you win. That's how you do <laughs> it. A little bit of seed of doubt. Yeah, that's definitely how you do it. And I mean, uh, the other thing is Bob Lazar's donating all the money that he makes, so he's not doing it for the money. Yeah, he's also pretty adamant that he doesn't want to be famous. I, I kind of believe him, but it's just so much. It's so, right. It's like I'm almost sweating just thinking yeah. about it. Like it, it takes your entire worldview and like. Everything you've believed and just spins it. It spins it, and then it's like, all right, well, what's next? Like some people say 180 degrees. I'm like, no, it's going around in circles and then ending up at a multiple of 180 degrees, but not 360. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> Jason Kidd. Anyway, <laughs> I was just, I don't know why I didn't realize this earlier when you were talking about uh, your work in the nuclear field. My uh, stepdad was like, he's, okay, so when I met him, he was a high school janitor. But he was, like, in control of the nukes in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Oh, yeah? And they then, turned, like, one of the keys? or like, He, like, had to watch over. Like, he was in control wow. of, like, that whole right. thing. And then when he, like, quit janitoring, he got a job working at a plant in Arizona and, like, moved away from my mom to, like, live in Arizona to help with this nuclear plant. I don't know why I didn't make that connection until right now. And right. He, that, again, that's, was, that's kablooey nuclear, not, yeah. like, turn the lights on nuclear, but, yeah. you know. Yeah, but it's just crazy to me because to me he's like a guy who drives a 1987 Toyota pickup, you know, and like gave me my first job and fired me from it, you know. <laughs> like... Well, yeah, I mean, most people at a nuclear power nuclear power plant, um, they don't like know calculus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, most of the people no are, college are, none. Yeah, most of the people at a nuclear power plant are they're workers. Um, and I mean, yeah, there's a bunch of engineers and scientists, but that's the minority. I, so he has since passed. I never asked him the question, like, how did you even end up in that? He was in the Air Force, and then somehow, like, maybe this guy makes sure things don't go terribly wrong for the uh, world. It was probably, I can, so you, you have the insider you, information. Well, if you're in the Air Force, it means that you're going to go, if you're, if you're in the military, you can get clearance more easily. So... You know, you're hiring someone to go work on, say, nuclear submarines. And you're like, all right, person, Ben, here's the basics. <laughs> we need, and, you know, you say you're running this, this show. You're like, all right, Ben, um, Mr. Rice, we need you to do X, Corporate Y, and Z. <laughs> they're not super hard. Like, they're, they're not high level in terms of needing experience, but there, there are things that you totally know how to do. Say it's like, I don't know, something audio recording related <laughs> which i'm sure you've done a lot of right and they're like well you're gonna need to get secret security clearance have you ever been arrested and you're like oh shit yes all right and uh, were you convicted for anything say you're oh. like yes right they're they they look at it as we need someone to fill this role this guy's got two dings against him it's gonna take how many months to go and get the actual clearance to go and because you have to suss out a lot more stuff right if there's so the other direction is, oh, you're in the Air Force. Yeah. So it's like, oh, you're you paid. already have some clearance. It's super easy to get clearance if you're already in the military yeah. and you don't have any strikes against you. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah. We know where you've been. Right. <laughs> For sure. So, yeah. It makes sense. But why this specific person? Because like, he applied. The... Yeah, very I'm telling you right now, it's because he applied. And nobody else. There's yeah. like no competition. Dude, that's what hiring is like. You're like, oh, you applied. You're way ahead of everyone else right now because yeah. you put your name in a hat. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, and being a good interview, he's a he's a fun guy. I mean, well, yeah. anyway, great guy, to, easy conversationalist. Awesome. You're good. Like if you like somebody, you're gonna hire them. Like uh, I used to be terrible at job interviews, like terrible. Then I'm like, why, why am I being a dick to these people and like trying to prove I'm better than people when I can just like, here's my accomplishments, here's what I do, here's what I'm like. Why am I being an awful, awful job interview? Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, what, I, what I love to do on job interviews, like, well, interviewing others, like, you know, is uh, if I like the, if I, if the person seems like a good candidate, this has happened twice now. I asked them to help me with something. This last time, it's uh, our new assistant brewer, uh, Alex, who's, I was supposed to write him an offer letter today, but didn't get to it yet. It's probably stressing. I'll let him know after this that it's, it's coming, but... Um, after his interview, which went very well, um, I asked him to help to ride over here with me from the brewery and help uh, my contractor and I install a bar. And he said, sure. Nice. And he worked out great. He was asking all the right questions. He was noticing what needed to be done in certain ways. You know, it was like that level of uh, engagement and, and technical yeah. forti fortitude, competence. <laughs> you just can't necessarily teach. Yeah. Uh, it worked out very well. Yeah. Once you find, like, a, a little seed of, like, the underbelly of the position, you know? Yeah. And you can riff on that. You, like, have stories about it, and you express your value in, like, understanding what that is. So much easier. 
Oh, definitely. Like, I was underqualified for the job I have at my current position. Like, I was probably the third least qualified, but I also, like, by, like, experience within the field. But adjacently, I had entered that field through... I, uh, I convinced my boss, who's been working in that field for 50 years, that I was the best candidate. And by, like... Like, his interviews were, like, 20 minutes. Ours was an hour and a half of just trading more stories. I'm like, I don't work in this, but I've, like, met it this time, this time, this time, this time, and this is how it worked out. But, like, 10 years ago, I'd have bombed that interview. <laughs> but be like, why don't you just give me the fucking job? I'm just fucking... I have the highest IQ in this fucking business. Like, oh, in God, this building. it doesn't matter. Like, yeah, it doesn't matter at all. I had no, an interview that moment. I'd say, yeah. all right, well, this isn't going to work out. Yeah. But, like, so, so what we do now uh, within Black Hammer... Because it's not that brewing is simple, but it's brewing isn't super complex, right? It's not something where you need to know calculus, right? Um, you don't have to have a ton of stuff memorized, but there's certain things you can't teach people. You just can't. You can't teach people how to uh, have a work ethic, be a problem solver, um, think outside the box, be a self starter, be responsible, um, care about what they do. Uh, be 100% honest at all times. Yeah. Like those, Open to criticism. Yeah. yeah. We could probably Adaptable fill out 10 is, things. And those are things you cannot teach. You can't. Unless it's your child. Yeah. Then maybe. But otherwise, no. Right. And so uh, like our new assistant brewer, he's never brewed a day in his life. Really? Never. Never, never ever homebrewed. And he was 100% honest with it. He's like, look, I've never brewed. But... He has a degree in chemical engineering, which there's a little bit of good old boyism there for right. me. But and, and the sheer volume of brewers who like come from a science background. And, it's science yeah. and art. And the reason there's some valid good old boys in there because chemical engineering is insanely hard and stupid to do. <laughs> like I could you could be so much more successful in the past like 10 to 15 years just by going to say computer science or computer engineering and if you have a brain that'll get you through chemical engineering you're going to get through that and you'll the world's your oyster right and so he's been working in uh, in Benicia distilling petroleum products okay making gasoline right yeah. doesn't really translate to brewing yeah however if you can learn to do that you could definitely learn to be an assistant yeah. brewer and at the same time, you can go and optimize some processes, and yeah. you know. Do you do, feel like you're taking your risk? No, this is, is no happening? risk at all. And why? Do, why do you think like this person has no experience? Why is it not a risk? I met him. Right. He's he's got it. He's 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 got the attitude. He's got the the fortitude, the attitude, the intelligence, and the drive and the will to take a massive pay cut. Because he wants to love what he does. What if right? there's a candidate out there who's got, you know, he can like weigh himself down with home brewing awards, but he's a dick who can't be taught. No, get the fuck out of here. I don't right. have time for that shit, man. Right. That's not going to work. Right. <laughs> Isn't that? And people think it's like, no, look at my medals. It's like, no, that doesn't mean anything. Are you coachable? Can you like adapt to our environment? We do, we do it this way. We have a, we have a culture. Yeah. Easter cultures. So it's a whole thing. Yeah, following cool. instructions is far more important. Yeah, right now. Yeah, like the the innovative thought. We'll get to that. Yeah, we don't need that right now. We're good. You can get there once you've proven the steps. Yeah. When we trust you to like not screw up the basics, we'll give you the innovation. So, I see this guy being a rock star if he can if he can handle the pay cut. <laughs> All right, we'll come back in a year and be like, "How's Alex doing?" Yeah, let's do it. I'm down. <laughs> and that's it we'll maybe he's going to be a rock star we'll just do a five minute how's Alex and then just walk out hey wait, wait, till, I, wait till I when I tell him hey I have this dis distillation column I want you to work on some stuff for me we'll be like, what does that mean and he's like I'm on it oh he'll know what's up yeah yeah he'll so, understand it intuitively definitely I think alright uh, so that alarm that went off was my uh, hey this is how long it takes you to close out your podcast break down and Perfect. get back to your car <laughs> so, Perfect, Jim I have terrible news we have to go Oh, it's been fun, man. This has been great. I, I was like, I don't know where we're going to go with this. Oh, I could keep talking for another two hours. I mean, that's the problem with the podcast. I can right? just keep going. And sometimes I do, and then people yell at me. It's a whole thing. I wonder what percentage of listeners are still on the podcast. 
Now we've done this Do before. Do you have data on this? I I don't look at it because it's depressing. Uh, <laughs> I feel you. It's like on tap reviews, man. We did this a few episodes ago. If you're still listening, email me, or just hit up the DMs, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, at Barley and Me Pod for in social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or email me at Barley and Me Pod at gmail dot com or Barley and Me Podcast at gmail dot com and say I'm still listening. We did this a little while ago. It's about yeah, about an hour twenty two in, <laughs> and um, I got five. I got five messages saying still listening. And you gotta assume one in ten will respond like I'm still listening. Yeah, okay, that's valid. And uh, I'm based in Sacramento. I don't have time for like promotion, so my listenership's not thousands. Let's face facts. But if we're saying one in ten response, that means one in three made it to this point in my listens average. That's pretty good. Uh, and if people are bad at math, it's 150 listeners per episode is the uh, about, about average for the first month. How do you feel about sending a few letters? What, is that, what does that even mean? Well, you could say, I don't know, whoever's still listening and sends you an email right now, we can send the Black Hammer Brewing stickers. Yes, I do I occasionally do giveaways. Okay. I just hope I have enough. <laughs> I'll forward the email to I'll Jim and I'll he'll decide. Him. I'll send it. So you send me, I'm still listening, I'll forward it to Jim, he'll get you your reward. I love this. This is what I want. <laughs> the interaction between the two of us is ideal. Because no one cares what I'm doing, it's fun to explain to the people, like, nobody cares about what I say. They care very much about what you have to say. Oh, that's why they listen to all my stories about Bob Lazar. So, uh, before we wrap up, uh, so Jim, where can we find you, Black Hammer Brewing, on the internet? Uh, so, Black Hammer Brewing is at blackhammerbrewing.com. And uh, Vilcommon, which it'll be linked from there within right. the next few days. It's Vilcommon, W-I-L-L-K-O-M-M-E-N dot beer. Ooh. Dot and beer is a real available thing? It is. Get it while you can. Somebody here doesn't have a website and has been uh, nixing it because no reason. I had a failed political podcast. I was like, this is a great idea. I'm going to buy the website immediately. This podcast, which has been named one of the best podcasts in Sacramento, like four years running, never built a website. <laughs> what am I it's doing? It's because you're busy. You're just busy <laughs> making quality content, man. Yeah, I can't. I don't. I don't even. I have no idea about coding. How am I going to hire somebody? I don't know. Dude, anything. go to, go to Fiverr.com. And I'm not plugging. I'm just. I was using it before you got here. F I V E R R dot com. Yeah, yeah. It's gig based. So if you like, I'm right. I'm getting someone to go and code my uh, my payroll spreadsheet right. script for. Well, uh, long-time listeners know my, my good friend Garrett Boatman, who's on every Christmas episode if he's available. Uh, big IT guy, builds websites for a living, so I usually hit him up, and then oh, I perfect. just never do anything with it. i just like, do this, and then I just forget <laughs> to follow up. <laughs> it's a mess. I feel you. Anyway, so what about social media? How can people find Black Hammer Brewing on social media? And we'll comment on social media. Um, we're on them. <laughs> we're on Facebook and Instagram, and we're on Twitter, but we don't Due to Twitter, Nobody, kind of, Twitter's no for political tweets. arguments, right? It's it's very specific usage. I barely use it at this point because it's like it's for uh, bad jokes and political discourse. Yeah. For a brewery, I'm like plug it if you want to, but like we well, so we use Instagram primarily, yes. and it's uh, because black, beer is beautiful. I think it's Black Hammer Brew or Black Hammer Brewing. It's one, one of it's, it's, I think it's truncated on Instagram yeah, or Twitter. There's some, like, character limit. I'm looking right now. Black so. Hammer Brewing. It is brewing. Okay. And then it's Black Hammer Brewing, and then Bill Common is uh, W-I-L-K-O-M-E-N-S-F. Nice. Because that's a pretty Instagram. common word. It's probably already taken. I mean, people in Germany, I'm sure, say welcome a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's German for welcome, in case yes. anyone wasn't sure. Yeah. It, I think, I hope it's self-explanatory, but maybe it's not. Well, it means welcome and well, come in. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. And, and we'll welcome com- in. And we'll come in. Yeah, it's so there's a plurality of meetings. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, and actually, this whole time while we've been on this doing this podcast, there's been muralists um, painting the Black Hammer Brewing I uh, that. Bauhaus slash trippy, pretty amazing mural. If I must uh, toot our own mural horn. <laughs> yeah, I. I was like, this doesn't look, doesn't look like construction, but there was definitely a lot of like, don't come in here. Yeah, we just don't want uh, we don't want paint in your hair. Yeah, you exactly. Know. <laughs> All 
All right, I think that's it. Anything you want to add before we go? No, not really. I mean, other than uh, come on to Vilcommon. Drink the beers. It's uh, Yeah, drink the beers. Eat the food. Eat the, oh, yeah. Did we, did we mention Rosa Mundo is no, our, is our business partner all. on Vilcommon? So the premier sausage maker seller in San Fr- in the Bay Area, really, because they've got a, two locations in San Francisco, one on Haight, and then uh, now here at Market and Sanchez at Vilcommon. Um, I think we have what, 18 kinds of sausage. There's a lot. Ooh. They're amazing. All right. Chicken yeah. cherry is really good. We didn't even Turner. talk about the food at your beer garden. Uh, next one, I guess. Fools. The food's we amazing. Are fools. What are we doing? What am I doing? Slacking. I'm a professional. I guess I'm a professional. Ugh. What's wrong? And I love food, obviously. Anyway, uh, I think we all have to leave. All right. Jim Perman. Cheers. Hammer Brew. Ben Rice. Uh, this has been episode 105 of Barley and Me. Thanks so much for listening. Get home safe. <laughs>